Well, great. It's such a pleasure to be here, timely or untimely as it may be. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to be theorizing about this with all of you. I have been like very in my like Kantian head about all of this, and uh, I really like to step outside of it. <laughs> so I'm going to put you inside my Kantian head, and then we can hopefully uh, get outside of it as uh, we move along. So. So as I've been trying to think about Kant's theory of imagination, of course you come across this question, what is imagination? And what a disaster to try and come up with a definition of what imagination is. I think that um, Noel Carroll describes imagination as the junkyard of the mind, because you're like, ah, there's all these weird phenomena like memory, fantasy, visualization, fiction, make -like. Let's just put it in the junkyard that is imagination. So, so I think actually in um, contemporary philosophy of mind, people have, for the most part, just given up on trying to come up with a unified theory of imagination. So what they normally do is just theorize particular imaginative phenomena, but, but don't try and answer this question, what is it to imagine? But I think that Kant has an answer to this question, what is it to imagine? So, so what I'm going to do in the talk today is just welcome you into my space of how I'm thinking about what it is to imagine for Kant. And, and the, the key phrase is going to be, imagining for Kant is the capacity to see more. Um, and that's what I want to work through. But to, to kind of give you some backdrop, in section one, I want to start with another traditional way of thinking about what imagining is, namely as fantasy. So, so Nathan was mentioning some early modern ways of thinking about imagining in terms of this sort of immediacy or perceptual presence of things. But I think that there's a longer tradition for thinking about imagining as fantasy that goes back to Aristotle. So if you go to um, the first passage on the handout, here's Aristotle. Uh, imagination is different from both perception and reason. In imagination, the affection is up to us. Whenever we wish, for it is possible to produce something before one's eyes. So we have this thought that in perception and reason, we're in some way beholden to demands on us from the outside, that in imagining, you can produce whatever you want. So fantasy is this ability to produce things from yourself rather than being beholden to what's given to you in some sort of way. And then you see this notion of fantasy carried forward in the early modern tradition. I could have given you a quote from Hobbes, but I'd give you a quote from Baumgarten because this is very influential for Kant through Baumgarten's second passage. I have the faculty of imagination, and since my imaginations are perceptions of things that were formally present, they are perceptions of the senses that while I imagine are absent. Right? So here we're coming up to this notion of fantasy as engaging not with what is present and real, but with precisely what is not present and absent in some sort of way. And then you see this carried forward in the 20th century in people like Sartre and post -world. So here's Sartre. Uh, the act of imagination is a magical act. Uh, it is an incantation to make the object of one's thought the thing one desires appear. The object as imagined is an irreality. So I think that if we follow through on this traditional way of thinking about magic, we actually get a very nice, tidy answer to the question, what is it to imagine? So as I put it, here's the traditional view. Uh, the definition of imagination here runs as follows. Imagination is fantasy. Imagination is a capacity that operates only in relation to what is not real and not present. So if you're thinking about imagining this way, you're going to take as your core imaginative phenomena things like the following. Dreaming, hallucinating, visualizing, remembering, and fiction. Now, it might be tempting to think that Kant gets on board with this traditional definition of imagination as fantasy. If you look at passage one, Kant says things like, Imagination is the faculty for representing an object and in intuition even without its presence. Or passage two from anthropology, quote, the power of imagination is the faculty of intuition even without the presence of an object. So it could be tempting to think that Kant is just taking on board this traditional view of imagination as fantasy. But I think it's really important that in these passages, Kant qualifies what he says with even without. 
right? He says that imagination is this capacity for representing objects and intuition even without their presence. And the thought is, well, if you can represent objects even without their presence, you could represent them even with their presence as well. So I think that Kant is very subtly signaling a break with tradition, and in particular, he has Baumgarten and Wolf in mind here. So he's denying that imagination is only the capacity for representing things in their absence or non-presence. He's trying to say that that's one dimension, but that's not all there is to it. So, so the thesis for this talk is going to be that Kant breaks with tradition, this tradition of thinking about imagination as fantasy, by endorsing a more capacious view, according to which imagining pervades our engagement with what is real and present as much as with what is not real and not present. Here's the problem. Once you give up on defining imagination as what enables us to engage with what is not real and not present, how do you define what imagination is anymore? Right? Fantasy gives you a neat, tidy way to think about the unity of imagination, but now you're saying, well, can engage with what's real and present or not real and not present, then, then what is imagination? So here's the view that I'm going to impute to Kant. Um, I'm going to impute to him the, the following definition of imagination that I anticipated before. Imagination is a capacity that enables us to see more. No more to say about that. And I'm going to take the following to be core imaginative phenomena. Um, so whenever we're thinking about imaginative phenomena for Kant, I think it's going to involve some sort of intuitive phenomena that involves actively taking up, synthesizing, or composing a manifold of intuition. So let me just get some Kant terminology out of the way here. Uh, so as Nathan was anticipating, um, of course, uh, you can't really think about anything in Kant's framework without thinking about intuitions and concepts. Uh, so as a refresher, intuitions for Kant are spatio-temporal representations of particulars, whereas concepts are intellectual representations of properties objects share in common. So we're looking at the microphone, right? The representation I have of it in this particular spatio-temporal location is going to be the intuition, whereas if I think about the sort of common properties that microphones have in common, then that's going to be the concept. Um, okay, more terminology, go to the next page. Um, uh, a manifold for intuition, so on Kant's view, um, whenever we're affected by the world through our senses, this gives rise to a multiplicity of representations in us, right? So we're taking in all of this information, and Kant thinks that means that now we have all of these representations running around in our head. And he thinks that it's the function of imagination, as Nathan was emphasizing, to synthesize or compose that multiplicity into some sort of ordered or organized sort of form. Um, and in particular for, for Kant, the sort of synthesis that imagination engages in is spatial and temporal, right? So when, say, I'm looking at this room and I'm taking in all of this information, on Kant's view, the way that imagination perceives is not just through thought, it's by ordering and organizing what I see in spatio-temporal relations, in foreground, background, into shapes, etc. Etc. So uh, to kind of give you uh, an example here, right? Look at the three dots on, on page two, right? Now you have a manifold of representations in your head, right? And if you're seeing this as a triangle, per Kant, that's because your imagination has spatially synthesized that multiplicity into a triangular shape, um, right? So to just go back to the sort of core idea be behind what is in a imaginative phenomena for Kant, as I put on the bottom of page one, it involves any intuitive phenomena that involves actively taking up, synthesizing, or composing a manifold of intuition. So helpful here to think about the distinction between sensing and imagining. So on Kant's use, sensing is wholly passive, right? So when I open my eyes and I just passively receive information, that's intuitive, right? I'm getting the spatio-temporal information from the room, but I haven't actively parsed it in some sort of way. And so the sort of sensible layer of experience when things are showing up in spatio-temporally organized ways, that's imaginative phenomena for Kant. So if we're thinking about imaginative phenomena in this really broad way, then it's going to include things that happen both in the presence and in the absence of objects. So when we're thinking about in the absence of objects, 
Things like dreaming, hallucinating, visualizing, sorry, visualizing, remembering, artistic creation. These are ways that we're intuitively organizing things in the absence of objects. But as the example of the room is anticipating for Kant, we also engage in this sort of spatiotemporal synthesizing in the presence of objects. So two cases here to think about perception and something like aesthetic experience when you're engaging with the beautiful or the sublime in some sort of way. So I've just opened the door to a lot more imaginative phenomena by thinking about Kant's view of imagination in terms of this capacity to see more. So what I want to do for the rest of the talk is really try to unpack how I'm thinking about what the capacity to see more is. And then I want to think about three cases in which we exercise this single capacity fantasy, space and time, and aesthetic engagement. So that's where we're heading. So, so page two, to try and unpack this notion of seeing more, I'm going to draw out two features of seeing more as I understand it. The first is what I'm describing as the presence independence feature of imagining. And of course, this is going to really link up with that traditional way of thinking about imagination as fantasy. So passage three, Kant says, Sense is the faculty of intuition in the presence of an object, imagination even without the presence of the object. So here we get this straightforward thought that sense right, involves intuitions that depend on the presence of objects causally affecting us. Right? So when I'm sensing the microphone, right, it is causally affecting me, and the intuitions that I have of it are the result of that object existing and present causally impacting. That's how we get intuitions of sense. But according to Kant, the intuitions of imagination aren't presence dependent in that same sort of way, right? Our imagination can generate intuitions even without the presence of an object. So this tells us that for Kant, whatever our imagination is doing, it's not just bound to what is causally affecting us here and now. There's a sense in which it has more liberty with respect to objects. Uh, but we, we can't go crazy here with how unbridled we think imagination is for Kant, because it's really important that on his view, imagination is not wholly unconstrained by what affects us. So passage four, he's talking about creative acts of imagination. He says, quote, the inventive, the productive imagination is, quote, not exactly creative, for it is not capable of producing a sense representation that was never given to our faculty of sense. One can always furnish evidence of the material of its representations. So here, Kant is saying, look, when our imagination is being exercised in a productive or creative way, it doesn't create ex nihilo. It is always drawing on material through which we've been affected in some sort of way. And then the creativity comes in by giving that material new shapes, new forms, putting it together, synthesizing it in unprecedented sorts of ways. Or passage five, he says, quote, our imagination cannot create anything. And it is true that it cannot produce any sensations in us that we have not already had. So we think about something like Hume's missing shade of blue. Right. On Kanti, you can't imagine a missing shade of blue if you've never had the sensation of it before. So the way that I should, the way that I cast this thought is that Kant places what I'm calling a material constraint on imagining. So for Kant, all acts of imagination are constrained by a manifold delivered through the merely receptive aspects of sensibility. So there's going to be two cases that we're going to think through here, an empirical case and an a priori case. Um, so in the empirical case, the sort of manifold that Kant thinks our imagination is going to be constrained by is a manifold of sensations of either properties or whole-scale objects that we've been given for our senses. But Kant also talks about an a priori manifold of space and time, uh, and we're going to get to how that figures in Kant's view in general. So, so what I've been trying to think through is the way in which Kant, in keeping with this tradition of thinking about imagination as fantasy, is endorsing this thought that there's a degree of independence that our imagination has from the presence of objects that the senses do not have. But it's not complete independence from 
objects, right? There's something from our material relation to the world that imagination has to be constrained by as it's generating its sort of representation. So imagination is present, independent, but still material constrained, materially constrained in some sort of way. All right, so that's one aspect of the, the, the notion that imagination is a capacity for seeing more. The second aspect is what I'm going to describe in terms of sensory awareness, or the sensory awareness feature. So when I use this phrase, seeing more, what I have in mind is being sensorily aware of more than we are immediately given through the senses. So even though I'm using language of seeing more, I don't think that the imagination just operates by way of visualization or visual images. I think that you can see more to a song, see more to the, the feel of a table. So, so when I talk about seeing more, I'm just talking about some kind of sensorial awareness, regardless of what sense modality, in which you're, you're, you're aware of more than you're immediately given through the senses. So to unpack this, go to page three. The top, I say, um, imagination is a capacity that enables us to see more, which doesn't depend on the presence of objects and makes us sensorily aware of more than we're immediately given. So to try and kind of think through the unity of Kant's theory of imagination in light of this notion of imagination's capacity to see more, now let's think through three case studies. So first case study is going to be uh, fantasy. Uh, so here's a nice passage from the Indian. Um, here's Dido lamenting the, the absent Aeneas. Um, quote, in the empty hall, lying alone on Aeneas's couch, seeing and hearing him, although he is gone. So how do we understand this very classic example of fantasy on Kant's view? Well, Kant thinks that what's happening is Dido has had sensory encounters with Aeneas in the past, right? She has seen him, she has heard him, and that's given rise to a manifold of Aeneas representations in her. And so then what happens in this moment when she's, she's, she's fantasizing Aeneas is that her imagination draws on those representations from the past and informs this intuition of Aeneas as absent, right? So, so he's not present the way that, well, I guess the couch is present for, for Dido. He's, he's present as absent. And on Kant's view, what allows her to have that sort of sensory awareness of Aeneas present as absent is that her imagination is actively drawn on these representations of the past and given her a representation in the present moment through which she sees more than the empty hall around her. So I take that to be a more obvious, straightforward case. Um, oh, I'm doing four cases. Oh, even better for me. Um, we'll see if for you. Um, so where I think it gets much more interesting and where we actually see the innovation in Kant's theory is when we start to think about Kant's account of perception. So very famously in the first critique, Kant says, quote, imagination is a necessary ingredient of perception. Right? It's perception is something you would never say if you were Aristotle, Baumgarten, or Sartre, right? Think back to the Aristotle passage, he's saying imagination is not perception. Right, but Kant says imagination is a necessary ingredient of perception itself. So I take this to be the basic idea behind imagination being a necessary ingredient of perception for Kant. Imagination makes more perceptually present to us than we are immediately given. So when we're thinking about perception, of course what we're immediately given through the senses is rapidly shifting over time and space, right? So with each new temporal moment, you're getting new information, and as your spatial perspective shifts or your spatial environments shift, you're getting more spatial information all the time. So the manifold of intuition is constantly in flux in a perceptual episode. And Kant's thought is that imagination is, allow, is what allows us to be conscious not just of this chaotic flux, but of something stable or something constant through this flux in some sort of way. So to give us an example to think through, let's think through a case of amodal perception. So 
So by amodal perception, I just have in mind a perception in which we represent parts of the object that are not immediately present to us. So think about approaching a house, right? Um, so so uh, as you are approaching the house, right, you're going to get all of this new information with each temporal moment and as you are stepping closer, right, with each spatial position. And as you kind of approach the house, the things that were immediately present to you on your kind of initial uh, approach are not going to be immediately present to you anymore. And as you get here, there's going to be new things that are immediately present to you. Or to think about it a different way, so as when you're like walking up on the house, you're like looking at the roof. Uh, but then when you're here, you're looking at the door. So the, the roof is no longer immediately present to you through your senses the way that the door is immediately present to you. Nevertheless, when you get here, it's not as if you think the house no longer has a roof, right? The roof is still perceptually present to you in this amodal perception. And the question is, well, what accounts for the roof being perceptually present to you even when you're only looking at the door? And Kant thinks that's what imagination does. Imagination makes these parts of the object that are no longer immediately present to you perceptually present in some sort of way. So think about a contrast here. You could have a sort of um, inferentialist account of an amodal perception where how do you have an experience of the roof as perceptively present when you're looking at the door? You could be intellectualist about it and think, well, you're just inferring from the door that this is a house and houses have roofs. But, but Kant doesn't think that's what's going on. Kant thinks that there's some sort of sensible activity that makes this roof perceptively present to you once you get to the door. Um, also notice that um, uh, in something like amodal perception, even though I'm just looking at the front facade of the house, I might have a sensory awareness of the house as having a backside. This is a very classic Husserlian uh, amodal perception. And Kant thinks that imagination is going to do that too. It's going to be making things like these occluded parts of the object, even if they're not given to you in that like, perceptual encounter, present to you in some sort of way. So, so I take the thought to be, Kant thinks that imagination is a necessary ingredient of perception because it is what enables us to have these experiences of perceptual presence. So in the fantasy case, right, our imagination is basically, well, Dido's imagination, is basically entirely fabricating the object that is present on the basis of the past. And then in perception, what is happening is that imagination is basically allowing us to hold on to and fill out the present in some sort of way, right? And I think that um, in both cases, though, we have a degree of presence independence in imagination, right? So in neither case are we wholly beholden in our imagining to what is sensorily given to us. And in both cases, we're seeing more in the sense that we're sensorily aware of more than is present to us. Right, so there you see imagination is this capacity for seeing more operating in a unified way, albeit in different ways, across these two cases. Okay, now we're talking about space and time, and it's going to get a little bit torturous. Um, but I, <laughs> it's really important for somebody, well, it's important for Kant, um, but it's really important for um, Heidegger's account of um, Kantian imagination. So um, I'm sorry, but, but here we go. Um, so, uh, case one and two, we're thinking about cases of empirical imagining. Case three, now we're jumping to uh, a priori activities of imagination. Um, and as you may remember from the first critique, one of Kant's really important uh, arguments in the Transcendental Aesthetic is that space and time are not real entities that exist independent from the mind, but space and time are instead these a priori structures that are built into our mind, and more particular, built into sensibility. Okay, passage six, Kant, in the table of nothing, uh, says the following. Space and time are ins imaginarium. Now notice this is like 300 pages into the first critique. I think he just like drops it. So the, the table of nothing is the last thing that happens before he gets to his critique of metaphysics. Um, 
And so this is a very tantalizing phrase, and you start to wonder, whoa, whoa, whoa. Does cosmic space and time are products of imagination? I mean, it would have been helpful if he said that in the preceding 290 pages, but you know, sometimes he only gets to the point later on, as much of us also only get to the point much later on. Um, and so, so there's one tradition for reading Kant's account of imagination as so crucially important because it is what is responsible for space and time to begin with at all. So just, again, a couple of reminders about space and time for Kant. Uh, one, he thinks that there are these a priori forms that are built into sensibility. So Kant thinks that we have a sensible and an intellectual side, which we call sensibility and understanding respectively. He thinks that there's a priori forms that are just built into the constitution of sensibility and understanding. Space and time are the forms that are built into sensibility, and the categories are the forms built into the understanding. OK. In analyzing what these a priori forms of space and time are, Kant describes them as pure intuitions rather than concepts. Remember, intuitions are going to be these these singular representations of particulars, whereas concepts are these general representations of common properties. So this is how Kant talks about what the pure intuition of space and time are. So first of all, bottom of page three, uh, he says um, the pure intuitions of space and time represent space and time as singular. Passage seven. One can only represent a single space, and if one speaks of many spaces, one understands by that only parts of one and the same unique space it is essentially single. So on Kant's view, if we think about the space of this room, or the space of Zagreb, or the space of Croatia, or the space of planet Earth, or the space of this galaxy, right? All of these spaces are part of this one space that is time. Or one space that is time. One space that is space. <laughs> uh, so two for time. There's only one time. Um, second thing, Kant describes space and time as having a particular myriological structure such that the whole precedes the parts. So passage six, nope, passage eight, he says, quote, these parts of space cannot, as it were, precede the single all-encompassing space as its components from which its composition would be possible, but rather are only thought in it. So when we're thinking about the one space, the one time, Kant thinks that these are single wholes and then all parts of space, all parts of time, are just delimitations of that whole. So the whole perceives the parts. Uh, last feature, if you go to the next page, of space and time, uh, is that Kant thinks that they're infinite. So Kant describes space and time as infinite given magnitudes. So passage 9, that the infinitude of time signifies nothing more than Every determinate magnitude of time is only possible through limitations of a single time grounding it. The original representation time must therefore be given as unlimited. Right? So when we're thinking about these singular holes that are space and time, he thinks that there's no definite bounds to either space or time. There are things that extend without limitation. And any part of space, any part of time, we're understanding just as a limitation of that infinite. Magnitude. Okay, so we have these pure intuitions of space and time, the singular holes that perceive their parts and infinite. And so now we have this question, okay, where do space and time come from? So when you read the transcendental aesthetic in the first critique, Kant nowhere says that they come from space and time. But when you get to the table of nothing, you might think, okay, maybe we need to reread what Kant said in the aesthetic in light of that claim and recognize that space and time are products of imagination. Um, so I'm describing this as a, a sort of radical interpretation of space and time for Kant. Uh, so here's a huge interpretive debate for nerdy Kantians. Uh, does Kant endorse a radical view according to which space and time are products of imagination? Heidegger says yes. So here's Heidegger. Quote, space and time are rooted in the transcendental power of imagination, hence space as well as time were designated as ins among an area. right? So, so when we get to thinking about Heidegger's account of imagination as the common root of sensibility and understanding, on Heidegger's view, right, imagination is that out of which things like space and time 
issue. Uh, and more recently, interpreters like Wayne Waxman or Beatrice Longinus have followed up with this sort of interpretation. So Waxman says Kant endorses the Intia Maginaria thesis, according to which space and time together with the manifold they contain were for Kant wholly products of imagination. So I think that we can be a little bit more precise about how we're thinking about this interpretive debate by framing it in terms of the question about two. So two is what I'm describing as these pure intuitions of space and time as a singular whole infinite. Um, and the question is, um, do our basic pure intuitions of space and time, a singular whole to perceive their part, and infinite, issue from imagination in the first place? Um, no, <laughs> is how I think um, Kant comes down on this. But to see why I think we need to really tend to his understanding of imagination as the capacity to see more. So on Kant's view, it's not that imagination is responsible for wholly presencing things, right? Imagination does not presence things ex nihilo, including space and time. So imagination does not presence space and time ex nihilo. Instead, when we're thinking about the presence and dependence feature of imagination, imagination is always material constraint, materially constrained. So whatever imagination is doing, it still has to be drawing on a manifold of representations that are delivered from elsewhere. And I think that this is true as much in the empirical case of fantasizing and perceiving as it is in the case of space and time. So here's how I understand Kant's account of imagination in space and time. For Kant, through sensibility alone, right, just the sensible structure that we have as human beings, we are given these a priori forms of space and time that include a representation of space and time as singular, wholes of perceived parts, and infinite. And then what our imagination does, as it always does, is synthesize that manifold into what Kant calls, quote, derivative representations of space and time. Um, so one way that he sometimes describes this difference, he says, look, space and time as pure intuitions are metaphysically given through sensibility. And that's our original or foundational representation of space. And then what imagination does is synthesize that metaphysically given stuff into these derivative made representations of space and time. Uh, so he, he makes this really explicit um, in this mathematical treatise um, uh, on Kessner, this, this doesn't matter. Um, but when he's thinking about sort of what's a good example of how imagination makes these derivative representations of space and time, he thinks about geometry, right? So, so uh, the example that I want us to think through on page four is the example of the, quote, construction of a circle. Um, so when Kant is thinking about how geometry proceeds, he absolutely does not have a logicist picture of how geometry proceeds. He has an intuitive picture of how geometry proceeds by way of our imagination, manipulating space and time in ways that we can learn geometrical truths about that given space and time. So let's think about constructing a circle. So per Kant, mathematical construction and geometry works as follows. Passage 10, to construct a concept, means to exhibit a priori the intuition corresponding to it, either through mere imagination, in pure intuition, or on paper in empirical intuition, but in both cases, a priori. So suppose you have the geometrical concept circle, right? Kant thinks that you get geometrical knowledge about circles, not ju by just thinking about the, the, the common marks that, that, that circles share in common, but you actually learn about circles by either drawing them in your mind's eye or on a paper um, with something like a compass, right? So we construct the concept circle per Kant by imaginatively describing a curve, all of whose points are equidistant from a given point. So when we're doing this, Right, we're taking this sort of given space that we have through sensibility, and then we're manipulating it, we're synthesizing it in accordance with this concept of circle, and then we can actually learn new information about circles that we wouldn't have had prior to that sort of 
intuition. <coughs> so I think that this is a sort of paradigmatic act of the derivative made intuitions that imagination generates on Kant's view. So to kind of go back to the structure that I've, I've been following, what is the manifold that our imagination manipulates when we construct a circle? Well, it's the a priori manifold of space that we're metaphysically given. Uh, and what are the intuitions that our imagination generates? Well, they're intuitions that represent a circle as a particular geometrical form by synthesizing that given space and time in accordance with a certain concept. Right? So, so the thought is, um, in the geometrical case, we get, we're seeing something more about space that we don't see just in virtue of having the kind of sensibility that we do. And in particular, we're seeing more about the geometrical structure, the geometrical form of space through these imaginative manipulations, right? So we're, we're, we're making more present to ourselves, we're seeing more in this geometrical construction, um, but not in a way that generates space and time, but draws on given space and time. Okay, so Heidegger is incorrect um, about so many things, uh, but also about this. Okay, page five, back to the empirical ground of things. The last sort of imaginative phenomenon that I want to think about is aesthetic experience. Um, and the, the basic thought is going to be that we have, according to my proposal, a different way of relating to time in aesthetic experience than we do in something like perceptual experience in particular. Um, and so too, I guess it's going to be different from how we relate to um, temporality in the geometrical case as well. But, uh, Note to self for later. Okay, so so um, one more mega torturous <coughs> quote from Kant about aesthetic experience. So just as a reminder, uh, when Kant is thinking about what aesthetic experience involves in third critique, particularly the experience of beauty, he describes it in terms of free play, right? Uh, and so here's a, a, a very long passage in which he describes what our imagination does in free play. So passage eleven. If the imagination is to be considered in its freedom, then it is, in the first instance, taken not as reproductive, as subjected to the laws of association, but as productive and self-active, as the authoress of voluntary forms of possible intuitions. So let me just pause there. Kant distinguishes between the reproductive and productive exercise of imagination, the reproductive exercise, he argues, is just governed by the law of association. So if you just run into a bunch of things <coughs> together in the past, you're going to form this human habit to associate those two things together. Right? So Kant thinks that sometimes our imagination just produces or reproduces representations as a result of this habituation. But in other cases, our imagination is productive. Right? This is when it is more inventive, more creative, more original, more free in some way. Okay, keep going with Pope, uh, four lines down. Uh, and although in the apprehension, a given object of the senses, it is of course bound to a determinate form of this object, and to this extent has no free play as an in invention, nevertheless, it is still quite conceivable that the object can provide it with a form that contains precisely such a composition of the manifold as the imagination would design if it were left free by itself. Okay, so let's think about what sort of characterization of what our imagination does we're getting in this passage. So, two core ideas. One, I already mentioned, right, imagination is proceeding in some sort of productive or self-active way rather than this merely rote, habitual, reproductive way. But two, and it's really important for Kant, the way that we apprehend the beautiful object in our imagination is bound to the determinant form of the object, right? So when we're engaging with something like, the example we use is a beautiful peony, Kant thinks that aesthetic experience is not just flying off the handle and thinking whatever you want in imagination. Somehow, free play involves our imagination engaging with the determinant form of the object in a productive way. So in this passage, con contrast the sort of free play of imagination and aesthetic experience with what he describes as invention. And his examples of invention include things like, um, quote, 
fantasies with which the mind entertains itself, as for instance, in looking at the changing shapes oops, of a fire, not a fire, uh, of a fire on a hearth or of a rippling brook. Right, so if I'm looking at the rippling brook and then calling to mind, I don't know, all sorts of things that are not present, right, that's not free play in Kant's sense. But you, you might think, well, how are one and two consistent, right? How can we be productive and self active and nevertheless bound by the determinant form of an object? So, so, so the proposal that I'm going to give is that there's a different kind of temporality involved in imaginative free play. Kant's term is lingering, violent, that allows us to apprehend the object in a productive way. So passage 12, quote, we linger over the consideration of the beautiful because this consideration strengthens and reproduces itself. And in a sort of temporal lingering, the staying in the present, Kant says, passage 13, we are, quote, at play in the observation of an object. So the thought is going to be, if I'm engaging with something like the free play with a peony, in ordinary perception, right, I don't linger in the present. I just recognize the peony as a peony and I move on with my day. But in the temporality of free play, right, we imaginatively linger. And that lingering strengthens and reproduces itself in some sort of way. And this creates a space for productivity and freedom that is nevertheless responsive to the determinant form of an object in some sort of way. So maybe there's different ways that we can think about what it means to be at play in observation in this lingering sort of way. Um, but, but some suggestions that I make towards the bottom of page five is that one manifestation of lingering is a certain mode of attention, right? So normally, if we're just in ordinary experience, we don't really attend to the wealth of details of things. We just notice enough details to recognize something and then move on. But in free play, we actually linger over the details. So if you're looking at a pink peony, right, you're lingering in the, the opulent shape. You're lingering in the lushness of the magenta or the contrast of color. So that's one way that we, we linger in imagination, by really taking our time with detail. I think another way is by synthesizing and resynthesizing what we're given in different ways, right? So there's like a standard peony form, but if you really start to look at peonies, at some point you're like, is this a sea creature? Is this a bomb? Is it like, what? What is it? And you can actually like resynthesize what you're seeing in these creative ways that's nevertheless responsive to the form that you're given. And finally, I think there's ways to freely associate, which aren't just like the Rippling Brook case, right? So I take it in the Rippling Brook case, whatever you're associating to has nothing to do with what you're seeing. Like, what you're seeing is just a mere occasion for you to invent whatever you like. But I think that there's ways to freely associate that are responsive to the form of what you're seeing, right? So if I'm looking at the peony, and then I start to think about, I don't know, pavilions. Right? Or I'm looking at the peony and I start to think about them as symbols of good luck. I take those to be responsive to the form, but nevertheless to be freely associated, associated in some sort of way. So to just uh, wrap this up, um, I think that if we theorize imagination as this capacity to see more in the way that I've done, I think that we have a unified way to be thinking about what remains constant across phenomena like fantasy, perception, space and time, and aesthetic experience but it also allows for a, a space of temporal play and temporal flexibility, which I think allows for differentiation within the imaginative unity. All right, that's it, thanks.